it says the software has reported to me, Rob Stenzinger of interactive-storyteller.com, that uh, we are now recording. I hmm. paused because Adobe Connect sometimes likes to cut off the first four seconds of... Uh, have you noticed that? <laughs> I've noticed that too. It, uh, it looks like we're just, uh, we're busy and we're just jumping in. <laughs> but uh, but I, what... I know for a fact, since I was there, I'm like, hey, that got cut off. <laughs> yeah, like one of the recent ones just starts with you going, Drozd, and I know you said my first name. Drozd, <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> nope, that's, that's, uh, eh, do I call anyone by their last name like that? Not really. Drozd. I... Yeah. Sorry. That was terrible. Oh, that just takes me back to Little League Baseball. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, to, it's, it's uh, hmm. disagreements in high school and gym classes and all that kind of stuff. No, not a. I got one friend that I shower. call by his last name, but that's because he demands that I call him by his last name. Like, he, he just does not like his first name. So, it's like, you call mm. me this. And I'm like, all right. That's what I'll do. Got some friends that go by their middle names. Uh huh. But no, I thought about going by mine for a while. My uh, just John. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's a nice. Not uh, just then, I don't have to explain my name to everybody all the time. <laughs> it took me a while. Uh, my middle name is Eugene, so uh, Gene. I, I dig it now. Yeah, Gene. You know, Gene Eugene Kranz. Is, Gene Kranz uh, was one of the greatest American heroes of the 20th century. The guy from Powell 13. Ah, uh, yeah. He, Mission Control guy with the white vest. Uh, that's right. That's right. I'm trying to think of the name of the actor who played him in the in the Tom Hanks movie, but anyway. Oh gosh, yeah. Uh, but anyway, we should get to it, talking about design. Uh, not yeah, not... but speaking of which, I'm talking with uh, none other than Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com. John Drozd <laughs> and Eugene Stenzinger, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, of uh, SugaryCereals.com. If you are. Uh, haven't heard. I started updating yeah. a comic there, which, you know, you can go look at it later. Uh, S-E-R-I-A-L-S as in serialized fiction. We will not belabor this point, but I'm excited about it. So, and then Rob, this kid, he does uh, some comics too at agz.me. So. I try. And when, when we're working on these comics, odds are we are employing different elements of design and thinking about how these designs are going to affect our potential readership uh, to define the audience that we intend on getting. Uh, and Rob's scrubbing through the slide deck now to get to these elements of design because uh, this is kind of an important part that we've been skimming. Hey, Eduardo. <laughs> Here we go. So design elements, Rob. I'll, I'll kick it over to you to talk about this as we conclude this design series. By the way, are yeah, you nervous? So, you nervous about uh, this, concluding it? Am I nervous about concluding it? I'm not because uh, maybe this is like my my non-committal loophole. It just there's I know it always gets deeper, and then there's always another question to ask. So there are no happy endings because nothing ends. Exactly. Uh, as long as I keep waking up, I can still explore this, and I'm <laughs> happy to explore it in podcast form from time to time. But I do think we'll be closing this chapter, and there are. Uh, we do have, you know, some kinds of endings and, and, and we step away from things from time to time. We want to get perspective on this and we don't just want to, uh, we love our abstract topics and whatnot, but, uh, let's not, um, let's not hold on to one. Let's, let's find others and keep it fresh. Yes. Uh, so here we go with, uh, design elements as sort of the, this is the third and, uh, final chapter of, of this take on the series, which uh, we've already gone through a bit of uh, looking at structure and flow, purpose and relationships in design and constraints. So things like anything from well, what kind of materials do you have available to you and the trade-offs that you make. We even did a little bit of this, not in the design series, but in our prior episode that was, let's see, what was it about uh, called uh, Buying the Couch before you move. <laughs> Before you move. <laughs> yeah, that was me, everybody. <laughs> that was a fun one. Uh, dealing all, with all sorts of constraints and compromises thematically in that one. Um, 
because, well, we do that when we're trying to intentionally make things and uh, achieve certain goals, but you've got to do it with what you've got. And then we've got the whole other aspect of uh, if you're doing this as an individual or in a group collaborating. And of course, if you're doing this for yourself or for someone else, whether it's expression uh, and a service, we've covered all that stuff so far. And that's in the prior two episodes of the design series, thinking about design. And uh, just to recap a little bit, and we wanted to chew on elements and... Yeah, what good is it to talk about all these different constraints and compromises and self-expression if we don't know what tools we're actually using when we're designing things? And I think our language is probably going to differ here and there because uh, oh. I think we, were, we agreed that you were going to come at this uh, from an interactive storyteller standpoint, uh, UX, UI, and comics, and music, and video games, and what don't you do? Uh, whereas I'm a one-note guy. And I come at this from those uh, static pictures juxtaposed in deliberate sequence to convey a, a specific meaning or emotion, as Scott McCloud of Understanding Comics uh, says. So you've you've got that note down well, and I can't wait. I think we we I think there's a lot of uh, depth in that topic. Just to bookmark it for the future, like uh, yeah, what's this uh, what's this jack of all trades business? Yeah. Anyway. So yeah, design elements. Walk us through this, Rob. What do you what do you mean? What are these things? Proportion, contrast, shape, perspective, rhythm, harmony, observational qualities of information. Huh? Uh, that's <laughs> well, observational qualities of information. I think that's what all of these things are. So we have elements of design. How do you break down? Uh, well, we we make something and we make it out of stuff. And so you keep using generalities and words that. I'm piecing things together to make this thing for people. Uh, it, and it, it just gets kind of murky. And you need to be able to sort of analyze it from different angles and, and use some kind of measure or tool or take on this topic. So like contrast. So we, we, we know that if we start concerning ourselves with contrast, we think, well, is this a useful design element? Well, contrast among things in an image or in a story or in a user interface allow me to detect the boundaries of what is what. And then I get to know also sort of how things relate to one another, perhaps because of different kinds of contrast, like proportion or different shapes mm -hmm. or perspective or harmony, and then sort of how they all fit together also both with rhythm and harmony. So to concretize what you're saying here, let's look at a web page, and let's use an mm. example everybody knows. Uh, you take a sidebar versus the main body, right? Yep. Uh, sidebar is going to have contrast often with a color difference, right? Like a wash of color behind the sidebar, or it might have proportion difference. It's going to be narrower or have different font sizes. Uh, might have different link colors for crying out loud, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. In, uh, you can have uh, different... You, you want to draw attention to the fact that the sidebar isn't the main content, which can help you know the relationship between the two areas. There's sort of a hierarchy going on of something is getting emphasized and something else has to be de-emphasized. De in order for that to happen. So one thing that you can notice um, in an in interactive set, whether in an application or on websites, websites especially, is when there's just a ton of elements and a ton of information. I don't, I don't mean like uh, a well-orchestrated army of interesting things, which is what I would call the UI of uh, um, comicsaregreat.com. You don't have to qualify it. I know you're not uh, not not uh, not dissing me. I'm no, and, and uh, let's see. Well, I didn't have to qualify it, but I did, <laughs> and I think it is an interesting uh, example of how you can have. It's not just about designing something sparse and then having n one little splotch of something in a sparse space and saying fancy. Now to, to go back, I can to... do very little, but I feel fancy. <laughs> to, to, to map it onto comics language, one of the um, criticisms that gets leveled at George Perez by people that I know uh, is 
God, that sounded like I was being snobby. Like, I know people who make fun of George. No, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant, like, not in the press. These aren't articles I've read. This is just by people that I know personally who looked at his work. Mm -hmm. And when I'm trying to sell them on why George Perez is so awesome, like, "Mm, it's really busy. It is. There's a lot of stuff going on on the George Perez page. But it is very carefully constructed and well-designed. It works. The taste isn't working. I don't think I have any George Perez examples. (laughs) Simonson, yeah, Simonson's another good example. But anyway, but the point yeah, is... Early go, in the series, we did have a very busy example. We'll go we back up Go back up to that, um, that front page of mine. Because here's an example of, of what is conceivably uh, a busy page. It's down a little bit lower uh, okay. after the... There we go. This is a page that has a lot going on with it, but I used design to harmonize certain elements to say, these pieces go together. These other two panels in the bottom lower left... This is a moment apart. This moment feels differently, has a different pace, a different rhythm to it. How do we know that? What did I do? Right? Simple stuff. I, I didn't do anything really sophisticated here, but I used the angle and uh, sizes of the action panels, the border around them. It has a unity to it, right? You just uh, used pretty much the whole list on this yeah. page. Um, yeah, absolutely. You, you, have, you have perspective, and uh, it's not listed on the page, but I, you have the spatial r- relationships going on here as far as uh when you use overlap and then when you put uh when you disconnect things but then all of a sudden you have uh angular shapes and then you have similar rectangular shapes here all the action uh, panels are are shot are uh, we are viewing them from uh a, an unusual viewing angle whereas the two square panels are at more at looking at the character's shoulder height so it's a more natural viewing angle to emphasize mm-hmm. that sense of this is a calm moment before it gets crazy again. So yeah, it's yeah. Uh, which which has an effect on the rhythm mm-hmm. and the likeness and uh, different kinds of similarities among the different groups and how they share different. And that's one of the with the things where you can start making up or coming up with your own terms for the design elements where you start looking for the commonalities and looking for the differences and how is that helping achieve different uh, goals or causing you to feel a certain way when you're experiencing design and then just tying it back to a bit of the recap and that's part of the whole purpose of this is uh, we're sharing this as an exercise to advocate and level up in talking about design and it's a good thing to do that in in my theory because it helps us sell it when you're providing it as a service. There is a an incredible value to all the thought that went into this page, for example, because it, in the absence of that, could as many concepts be conveyed, could they be conveyed so efficiently? There, there's, there's, there's yeah. things worth losing by not caring about design. So let's care about it and spread it, so we get paid right. to do it. Right. This, it, it, also, and again, this is another thing where uh, I, I want to underline this, and then we can move on. Is that to the average reader, are they looking at this and going, "Oh, well, I can clearly tell that this is a more exciting sequence because of the black lines around the panels, and because of the unusual panel shapes, and because of the unusual viewing angles." That, that stuff isn't registering in the frontal cortex. This is stuff that... But, but I will say that that same person is picking up on this stuff. Uh, well-designed things uh, affect us whether we're aware of it or not. Right? Uh, anybody who's ever watched a movie and going, I didn't like it. You know? But what didn't you like about it? I don't know. It just it didn't really appeal to me. Right? So. Exactly. It's because... Here you go. Uh, it's uh, in... in... I'm just going to tease a little bit. We want to talk about a little bit of how we, how we can do some leveling up on design as well. Yeah. And you're reminding me that, well, when we're designing, obviously we're designing for other people. So what's the, the, the experience of being a person and, and how do we understand the world around us? How do we experience it? Looking at those things can help us master aspects of design. So mm-hmm. you were saying that someone who doesn't even care about, like maybe they don't have a vocabulary that allows them to sit down and use those same design techniques, mm-hmm. but they are a person. And if they're of the right general audience that you're targeting, the you know in you have pro written prose here and 
cultural refer- references and whatnot that uh, you're talking to you know, someone from our, our day and age that speaks English mm-hmm. that at least can, can has like some basic comic comprehension, right? They fill yes. a couple of those basic check marks on it. You know, it's like, can they do these things? And then they don't really need to know about the rest of the, of the detail. You, you can accomplish Absolutely. that because they're people. And they're Absolutely. affected by the same forces. And, and and this is aside from any kind of personal taste thing. I mean, is this page designed for somebody who uh, is an eight-year-old girl who maybe, or let's go even younger, like a six-year-old girl who's watching Yo Gabba Gabba or, you know, whatever, you know, popular kids show on TV right now. Uh, mm-hmm. Is this designed for them? No. Uh, it's designed for a very specific audience that I've sort of defined through my own personal lens of somebody who's generally in the na- neighborhood of me. <laughs> <You know? laughs> there um, you go. It's 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 some of it is that expression and yeah. and uh, but at the same time, a, as the you same characterized time. it quite a bit that you're doing it as a service too. I am. I want people to read this and I want them to like it and I want them to understand it. I'm not trying. To, I'm not trying to make work for them. That is another kind of design, which is perfectly legitimate, too. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. I don't want to hang on this page for too much longer. What else do we got? We got value, color, proportion. Mm. What else did you want? Where else did you want to go with? Or do, are we done defining these? Well, we may come back to them. Okay. Um, th- this is basically, yeah, let's highlight the design elements. And you know what? These aren't the design elements. We could probably list. Yeah. Mm, I don't know. If we really tried, I would bet we. This would be a mighty boring podcast. But I'm gonna say a hundred at least. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't want this to be too much of a, uh, a lecture. No, right. and it, that's not the point. I, I th- what that means is like I think we could sit here and look at the things in our offices. We could we could recall experiences and then come up with these qualities, right? These observational qualities of how someone is able to affect that information and how it's affecting us. So, would you say so. it's more important rather than to create a um, an index or a lexicon of these things? It's more important to just have that observational eye always wandering and collecting yeah and and i do think it's it's handy go ahead and, and hit the uh wikipedia page about visual design yeah. or refer to different resources because guess what there's a lot of really uh smart experienced experts that have tackled this that yeah. cared a lot about it and they've got cool stuff to say so yeah see what they have to say on it and they use a lot of words like what we've put out here okay but it's so. not comprehensive so where next? Um, you know, did you want to talk about some? Did you want to talk a little bit about how this works in uh, UI UX design a little bit? Because that's that's your wheelhouse, hmm. Hermano. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, certainly. So let's see. Let's get to some examples. Yeah, here. you did an article we should plug. Uh, oh yeah. So uh, let's see. Earlier this week. Um, no, it was last week. Uh, I did an article that was basically um, taking a, a portion of my uh, using storytelling to m- to make your comics UI awesome class, and uh, essentially, it's saying that well, as storytellers, you have a lot of skills that go into the what you could let's see you could apply your skills in storytelling to how your story is presented in a digital medium and that could be a website or that could be uh thinking about having a very interactive pdf or what have you um but it's but it's a different kind of thing than just saying oh it's 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 a book and you flip the pages there's more to possibly bring to that experience and uh what the the, I, I won't go through the entire article here, but you can come up with uh, a list of goals that you have as a creator and a list of goals that your users have and your readers. What would they want from this entertainment experience? And then what do you want to bring to them? And how do those things overlap? And you can come up with uh, what I like using the term uh, user interface elements. There's that generic word again, elements. It's a, it's a helpful bucket kind of word, though, because it's just saying I've separated these things and I'm recognizing them as separate things. 
and they have a certain meaning and they fit together in a certain way. So, for instance, uh, the parts of your comic UI, which could be uh, one way to look at it would be you've got an element of uh, some navigation that's meant to draw new people's eye. And you want to know, well, who made this? Or in other words, like, well, what's the brand here, right? Mm -hmm. And what can I do here? And what's available for me? Then, of course, while I'm here to read a comic, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. And then I want to explore. And then, of course, there's more elements because it's a web comic. So there's a blog and there's advertisement and, and drawing attention to other projects, too, if you're curious about other things I do and uh, that kind of thing. And so I'm, I created, uh, um, let's see, how does this fit into our design elements? One, it, one, one constraint that you're dealing with here is so, you, so you've got those goals. You, you don't want to start incorporating, well, and I want people to be able to run apps on my website that manage their to-do lists and whatever. And I'm, I'm actually a whole portal destination. Right. You know, uh, you could add a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, I've got some fun ideas I, I would love to add to my site at some point, um, more interactive things and whatnot. But it's more, so those lists are, are set a series of trade-offs. So you can focus on doing those things. But then you also have, well, there's just so much visual real estate and you've got to make choices to emphasize and de-emphasize certain things. How could you emphasize some things, right? So if something were really important, Jersey, what, like where would you put it on, on like a web page? Uh, it would be the, the most important thing would be the largest element. Um, it would be also, generally speaking, considering that a lot of our uh, audiences tend to be a Western society in starting in the upper left or that general neck of the woods. Um, the comics are great site follows this exactly. The logo is in the upper left. And then the first thing you see in the upper left is the latest thing. Here's the latest thing I want you to look at. This is the latest, most important thing on my site. Um, and then everything as, as its importance diminishes, it reduces in size. So it, that was very much the thinking that I had on the, on the design of the site is let, let's just use the same kind of operating procedure I use for pa use for panels. Panels size represents either differences in time or differences in emphasis. The bigger the panel, the bigger the emphasis, the bigger the panel, the longer the amount of time. Therefore, mm -hmm. largest element should be the most important one, the one I want people to linger on, the one I want the one I want people to really interact with. And then as things get smaller, these are things that are less important that you interact with today. But if you look onto the upper right of the site, there, there are the three main sections of my site. Do you want to know about my workshops? Do you want to know about my comics? Do you want to know about my uh, professional illustration portfolio? And then it gets progressively, and then like you'll notice that the social media widget or the social media uh, thing in my sidebar, very small. Like, yeah, that's there. <laughs> if you really, if you want to follow me on these different things, there it is. You know, I'm not going to hide it from you, but it's not as important as these other things. Did I answer your question? Absolutely. And uh, it's, I think that if we asked 20 different uh, webcomic artists who do put out their own site, how they think about, well, what is the most important element and what do they put where, I would imagine a lot of them would have answers to that, and I don't think they all have to be the same. I, t I very much agree with um, if if you were writing sort of just like here's some quick advice, stick to this, and you're you're going to do you're going to do good things probably for yourself and your users. That yeah. is uh, that's top notch. Whereas um, I definitely go awry of that list because I like to experiment, <laughs> and and as well if we look at the brief timeline of my comic UI, uh, yeah, I went hyper sparse and then started playing around with where I wanted things to go and whatnot. But, but that's how these, these breaking things, having a, a design, a pattern for what I want to put out, grouping the concerns, putting them mm -hmm. into elements and saying, now I can slide and shift them around and emphasize and de-emphasize and play with them over time. Yep. Yeah, so that there's some examples of how you can 
you can use those design ideas in a uh, so going back to your going back to your sure. list uh you know shape size line color value what were some of the other ones that we had in there uh that you, whoa there goes rob i lost rob everybody and that means that i get to vamp while we try to get the man back or i will simply have to there he is my word what happened <laughs> i did the back gesture on my magic mouse or um my apple uh that magic, yeah, pad. magic pad here and uh since i'm running adobe connect in a web browser it went back <laughs> oh funny yeah well you weren't gone long i didn't have i thought i was going to vamp for like a whole like you know five ten minutes um but going back to this, line, size, shape, mm. value, color, proportion. So shape and proportion, right? Um, line and size. Yep. So you had the thin border panels, oh. thick border panels. Yep. And then color. I mean, some of those different iterations of Art Geek Zoo Oops. that you were showing earlier had different color schemes all together, right? Let me see if we find Oh, there gosh, go. yeah. Um, because, well, exactly. And so there I was playing around with the tone. So... When I when I set this same artwork and you know this progressing these new additional comics, I intended to have them all in color, uh, and then I decided that that just takes too long to make for for the time being. But what happens when I frame them in in a lighter background versus a darker background, and how does that affect the the sort of tone of the comic, and how? In in my my I want the the user interface to be part of my voice as a storyteller, and uh, yeah, playing around with the colors, kind of like uh, the example example we talked about recently, the uh, the filmation skies, right, where you're dealing mm, with yeah, you can you can do so much with that one element, and it doesn't have to be a hyper detailed texture or a mural; it can just be one color. Yep. That's a really good example, and and when you look at those shows, look at the stills, you can see very, very different kind of uh, completely different tones when they use like a blood red and purple sky pattern versus the bright green and yellow sky pattern. So yeah. Okay. Well, um, what about um, was there anything else that you wanted to tackle in the whole uh, uh, the idea of paneling and design? Like I, I see you have yeah, some other I, like really cool examples yeah so i mean what you're talking about in the language of a cartoonist at least this cartoonist is what i would call advanced paneling techniques and i'll go back up here through some of these examples where um oh man this is a great i love this this book um as a matter of fact i have a copy right here this is funny cool what is it i love the artwork so it's called exit by uh, Nabil Kanan, mm. and this book, this, this was put out by Caliber Comics years ago. I don't even know if it's in print anymore, and I've read this book so much that all of the pages oh my. are out of their binding now. It's a, it's a beautiful book. It's really well executed. Uh, I would recommend it to anybody except good luck finding it. Mm. I don't know when the heck this thing is going to be put back into print. But this is a sequence where these two kids are walking along in the woods, and they trip upon what appears to be a dead body. And that's the same two kids in this whole sequence. Wow. Start on the left, and we see the two kids talking, and then there they are again, a little bit more on the right. We have the unifying element of the body. We have the unifying element of the forest, but the forest itself, the trees are being used kind of as like a visual cue to show the differences between the moments, right? He's got them properly uh, staged to differentiate or to separate the different uh, moments of the sequence. Yeah, th there's a lot of clever storytelling in this book. And I don't think that this is the kind of uh, artistry that is in defiance of a traditional audience. I think a traditional audience gets this. Uh, I show this example in a lot of my classrooms, and people get it. But when I break it down for them, they're like, oh, yeah, I guess it is weird when you look at it, that it's actually one, two, three, four, five, six panels in one mega moment without using any panel borders whatsoever right oh, it's a honestly i it's an it's amazing i am totally blown away by this 
uh, <laughs> the, this panel. It, seriously, it uh, it's one of those kind of masterwork things where, yeah, the how the trees are being used. They're not quite panels, but they're they're doing some of the job. They're helping direct my eye, yeah. because that's another thing. Well, um, not to be you know picking on any given sense or whatever. So we're we're you're trying to um, arrange information for the consumption of people. And obviously it's for people who are sighted. A lot of comics things are, are of that nature. And uh, it's about catching people's eye and directing it and having it flow through the scene. And you've got the arrangement of the balloons. You've got, and the, the trees working in harmony together. And mm-hmm. then you've got this unifying element, like you said, that of the, of the body um, laying across the bottom. Um, Mm -hmm. and then you have, well, so another, uh, elements that that, that you can talk about, about visual design and whatnot, you have the, um, well, positive and negative space, right? So you have the objects that are taking up space, but then you have the space around the objects and that space is sort of an object and it's so it's totally working as a, as a, once you identify things as specific things, like the elements, elements play against one another, right? That's, yep. uh, it's a, yeah, it's a squishy thing to, to say, but it's sort of like, well, in, in music and rhythms and how different, uh, instruments will play off one another and counterpoint one another, um, the contrast that is created by the two, playing together yet doing something different is a lot like the the visual effect of positive and negative space and it helps create contrast which words like energy and things get used where that I don't know if that's quite maybe it's in, in a way it's trying to ascribe kinetic force to mm-hmm. your eyeballs <laughs> bouncing off of stuff and being moved through I don't know well, I mean, you're talking to a guy who, when he reads comics, he actually feels the movement of, like, if it's done well. A well-made comic, I actually see the characters move. I feel them move mm. in the story. Um, so that doesn't seem weird to me. It may seem weird to some people. But to your point, yes, we're talking about contrast here, and I would submit, I don't know if you can see the drawings I'm doing on the screen. I hope totally you can. can see them. I would submit that these yellow areas are as important as the areas I've marked in red. Those are visual beats. Those are moments that we interpret as pauses in the narrative. They're talking, 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 pause. Talking, 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 pause. Talking. And in, 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 uh, in, in the context of the sequence, the character with the, the, the boy, his watch broke earlier in the story. And uh, this the, when they find this body, uh, here he is saying in this panel, he's like... Uh, Come on, what what what's his pulse like? And there's a pause, and she says, "Your watch," and that's the moment where we know the character's dead. Well, mm. We think he's dead. It, there's, it's a long story. It's a long book. It's a great book, but um, anyway, the point is, is that those little areas I've marked in yellow, these these black areas, are contrasting with the density, the visual density of the. Um, dialogue scenes the dialogue scenes have rhythm in the in the way that we read them but they also have a rhythm in the way he's const- constructed the balloons look at not all the balloons are the same size everybody mm. short balloon short balloon longer 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 balloon short balloon short balloon medium balloon medium balloon short balloon medium balloon right all of this is constructed for a reason as well that's another shape and contrast and um, you know going back to all these other uh, design elements these are all intentionally placed to create that kind of rhythm. Yes, we're looking at the work of a master storyteller right here. I, I am in love with this page. Like, I could frame this dang page in, like, a <laughs> huge, uh, I, I mean, I don't know, like a whatever, two-foot-by-four-foot frame and be quite pleased with that. I sincerely wish I could get a copy yeah. of this book. This is There There are uh, a handful of books that whenever I go to conventions, I, I dig through the quarter bins to get as many of them as I can, like the Amethyst Princess of Gem World mm. series, which DC is now collecting in a collection. I highly recommend everybody get it. It's cool. a it's a wonderful treatise on advanced storytelling techniques, the work of Ernie Colon, uh, even if you're not into princesses. Um, but this would be another one that I would get everybody if I could, because I think it's truly a, a, a magnificent work of, com- one of the finest works of comic storytelling. I need to look into see if this guy wants to come on my shows. And um, it's also... Uh, 
maybe these two things are inherently tied, but to say that it's that strong of a work of comics must it it, it would likely indicate it's also a, an incredibly strong work of design. He's using all this stuff very in, in, effectively and intentionally, right? You don't you don't put together a panel like this just mucking about. <laughs> no, it's really awesome, uh, and it it is yeah it really it does remind me of of how in music when uh, you have these punctuated moments and I don't know, I'm a sucker for when a you have a, a a singer and a guitarist working together and. Perhaps, oh, okay, well, let's say, all right, Metallic, Metallica's Damage Incorporated, and you have a drum roll, and then go! <laughs> and there's this, there's, yeah. a, there's a build up, there's a, there's a lot of information, right? There's a punctuating, uh-huh. contrasting moment, and then a person adding like a little bit of a verbal, you know, boom. And then the guitar well, to use, takes off. To use more of a pop music kind of reference, um, Eye of the Tiger. Oh, sure. Bam. Bam, bam, yeah. bam. Would that work without those pauses in there? Uh-uh. It, it, you need the the rest to cause the you impact. Do. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I totally agree. Yeah. And obviously this this is a good example of that. Design people. It's powerful stuff. And I mean, here's another one that uses a lot of like you know ABCs mm-hmm. of design. Oh, Oops. Goes went. It, it backed up when I turned on the drawing tools. So here's Walter Simonson, who is, again, in my opinion, one of the finest living cartoonists uh, on the planet. And I've used this in some, of my, I've used this in a lot of my classrooms because I think it's a fantastic page. Not only is he using design elements to guide. Oh, let me get a brighter ink so we can see what the heck I'm tracing here. Get a nice bright red and get a nice fat ink line. He's guiding our our eye in some very unusual patterns right but let's map this on to i'm going to open up a copy of war and peace and all of a sudden tolstoy wants me to go like this on the page i'm going to go what is your problem mister uh you know what kind of lsd are you taking that you want me to read a book like that but in comics we get to do this we get to take advantage of the rules of visual arts as well as the rules of literature and how did he pull this off how did simonson do this this is why i consider the man a master storyteller because he's very intentionally placing text elements. He's using the arc of the human torch's flight to point our eye down. Here's the human torch's arms using, uh, what, what, what element am I, is he using here with the, the fanning out of the arms? Oh, that, that negative mean? space as far as... Uh, negative space. Yeah, because that, that creates a shape by having... Mm-hmm. His arms out like that, um, and look at where the base of that triangle lands, right on this guy here, which anchors us with this nice square panel. And then when we move to the right, which is the natural reading direction, all of a sudden we catch the little fin on this time machine, which goes where does that go? That goes back up, and now we have another arc that points back up this way mm-hmm. and lands us here. This puts us on the bottom left hand or yeah, bottom left corner of this panel and look at the angle. Look at the viewing angle there. Look at what he did. He chose to show he could have done this with the panel. Here's the thing. Well actually this is Miss Marvel there. And here's Thor. And it could have been word balloons in the exact same spot. Right? Yeah. But no, he chose this viewing angle. So it guides our eye naturally to go, hey, wait, I gotta go here. And I arc back to Thor's head to land there. And this nestles us right next to this guy. And then plus we have this wonderful circle. This catches our eye because we're always looking for patterns and looking for things that remind us of a human face. This looks like an eyeball there, which makes us say, pay attention. And not only, if that's not enough, Simonson's not done yet. He has all of these different rock elements proceeding towards that central eye point, right? right? Look at that. Positive and negative space. Uh, it- that is like putting 10 exclamation points <laughs> after a word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, except it's cooler because it's, it's, it's doing more than, than, than the redundant exclamation points would do. There, there's, it's finding other ways to then reinforce it more. Um, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, there, there's so much going on in his pages, and it's not just the excitement of the visual density that I love about his work. It's also the design of his work is that he... he 
design is also, in my mind at least, and correct me, I don't say correct me, but feel free to weigh in on this and give me a different point of view, Rob, but I think part of what makes design exciting is finding new designs to express the same idea or finding a new sort of angle to look at the same idea, Be, finding your own voice in it, being inventive, contributing to the overall medium, and who would have thought in 1938, 1925, whatever, that along would come an artist who would completely reinvent the way we look at a page, right, with this different kind of reading directionality. Now, I know Simonson's not the first one to do this, uh, but this is a really good example of an artist who is thinking about uh, thinking about a comics page beyond the, the three-tiered grid of panels. Sure. Right? I mean, he could be serving his clients in a way or his employers in a way that just checks things off of a list. So yeah. uh, he's getting paid. Yeah. The, the, by adding the information to the page in some overly efficient way, you just have word balloons floating horizontally, or maybe it's just sort of uh, what you could do this in what, one, two, three, four, five. So he could do sort of a, a you know, a four, four panel grid with one, one across the top. He, he could do something pretty static and boring, but then, mm -hmm. But but taking a step back and saying, well, you're putting all of this in front of someone that every single element could do its job and maybe a little bit more. And in harmony with other elements that are all working to pull off the same thing, where they're all trying to do more than just their job, they, there's this reinforcing power and energy through the whole work which then mm -hmm. gives it, what does it give it? It means it's, I would say it's more likely to deliver its message and it's more likely to have a desired positive emotional effect, such as people spreading word of this thing. It, it could become an, an object of love, essentially, where someone says, wow, this was an awesome story. It was I just was, I read it in, in like 10 minutes, but then I read it again and again and again. And you've got to read it too. I, I can't believe this. Whether or not they know about how these elements are, effect, are are doing their work, they know it affects them. And I think mm -hmm. you're more likely to affect people by having that kind of concern toward design. This comic came out in 1991, so I was in high school at the time, and I was uh, I was collecting a lot of comics. Comics were about a dollar back then, so I mean, you know, like I was e it was easy to cobble together five to s to ten dollars out of my lunch money every week to support a comics buying habit. So I would go to the on Wednesdays and get, you know, five to ten different comics every week. Um, a handful of them would make me go, "That was awesome." Simonson's run on the Fantastic Four and also his run on Thor would literally leave me breathless sometimes where I would be panting after reading it because it was just so exciting, so good, and I couldn't... Sometimes I could pin down what made it so good for me. Other times I couldn't. But the, the point was is it there was something about it that made it stand out from everything else. And many other comic scholars will back me up on this that he was is one of the masters of our medium. And I think this is one of the reasons why. Um, so yes, I did an example here on the right where here's the same sequence told with just a grid. Mm -hmm. And is that as exciting? It delivers the same information. Granted, these are crude drawings that I'm just doing in, you know, the connect software, but no, it, it's a good example of roughly these, these symbols working. That's, that's funny. I, uh, one thing, one question I had, like your example points out how, if you, you could defuse and not you could provide the information without the energy or as mm -hmm. much energy you could you could have really beautiful artwork in every single panel but then not have them working together in some overall work of interlocking forces mm -hmm. then exactly but i'm I, this i'm totally guessing at this like so what if uh if reducing and creating simpler symbols out of uh, Walt Simonson's work, I bet it wouldn't lo lose any energy. If it were, so in other words, like let's, let's if you did just black and white shapes and uh, got rid of some of the background 
information and um yeah i i think this yeah. last christmas this last christmas i got um oh what is it called it's like it's it's this giant book of simonson's original artwork from his thor run i think it's called uh it's like a Thor omnibus mm. kind of thing, but I, I forget what the exact... I'll look it up and put it in the show notes, but it's this giant book of uh, high-quality reproductions of the original artwork from that run on Thor. So we're getting to see it in pure black and white with the mistakes on there, with the white out here and there, with notes in the margins. Oh, my gosh. Seriously. Uh, I was I was just... Uh, I was trembling <laughs> while I'm reading this book. It was so good. Um, and it doesn't lose a darn thing to take out that layer of color. You know, it's like you look at it without the color and it's like, wow, this is just as good. You know, it's like there's there's something in the way he's constructed his shapes, his lines, the context of, of them all together, the contrast, um, the negative space. It all just works. So, that is yeah. super cool. You mentioned that book, because here's my next question about Walt Simonson's work or someone working to produce something of this quality of all these interlocking design forces, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, let's see, how they bring that about, like how many, um, two questions, how, how are they, it, how can such a design fall out of their head? I mean, is it, is it many sketches? Is it theories that get tests and tossed aside and uh, yeah. strengthening things like maybe genetic algorithm style, making a page, then breeding it with other page ideas and then seeing which one's stronger and whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then... I mean, this is a totally separate question, but if you took one element of that well-designed page and then said, wow, I totally have to, I don't know, I've got to go pick up my kid or I'm out of coffee, I'm going to phone in this one part, would it ruin it? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a toughie. I mean, obviously, I, I, don't have, I don't have access to the man's sketches and notes, although I have seen some of his thumbnails in, um, I have a, a Thor Visionaries collection of his work, mm -hmm. which is um, the full color comics plus some extra notes in there. And his notes do tend to look pretty much like what the final page is going to look like. So if there's any other iterations of the page, I haven't seen them. Um, but speaking for myself, uh, yeah, my pages undergo a couple different iterations, and there are times where I come up with really interesting design ideas for a page, where this is a unique way of looking at this scene, or I'm getting triple duty out of one drawing out of this particular sequence. Um, but then I'll find out that that scene doesn't need to be in there. That scene is superfluous. I'm just doing this to show mm -hmm. off. goes on the cutting room floor. I, when I finish the front... Uh, Petty Dreadful, the new story I'm working on. I'll share those notes. There was a whole sequence where I was really pleased with this neat little design trick I did where I was showing this over here and then simultaneously showing something way off in the distance that was disconnected from that scene over there. But I found a way to use shape and line and negative space and contrast to um, create a relationship between those two areas. Mm -hmm. So we, don't, we can easily connect them in our minds and it doesn't feel like it's disparate moments. But in the end, it didn't need to be in the scene. So... Oh, it's a painful thing to cut that loose to say, you know, this is a clever invention. I'm proud of this, but it's it doesn't service the story at all. You know, and I'm sure lots of artists face that kind of decision. Um, if I can real mm -hmm. quick, I also want to say, so nobody misunderstands me, that this crude example I've shown is not to say that grids are not as clever in terms of design. Uh, because what what I am saying is that you could do the same thing with design and I'll do this with this grid over here, where the the images in the panels interact to, to create their own kind of design, right? Ah, sure. So that if you squint at it, there will be a relationship between all of these panels and the way that they're constructed and the way the shapes all work. Um, Let's see. You took so some it, art history, right, Jersey? So can you help me out here? A um, with, uh, <laughs> what? what was that, that movement? Uh, it was Art Nouveau or something where... Uh, there's a lot of these kinds of points that are more or less exemplified in art that a lot of people, when they walk up to it, they'd be like, I could do that. And they just, where the, the, the art existence represents proving an idea about a principle or demonstrating something about the power yeah. of uh, a shape or 
the negative space with one tiny element in it or how simple colors can interact and create a certain energetic mm-hmm. feeling. And it's about those kind of results where they're just, in some ways, they're proofs for these sort of ideas. Yeah, you're talking about the pieces where it's like, it's like a canvas. Yep. And it'll be like this on the top and then, oops, and then this on the bottom. Right. And that'll be the whole piece. Ah, yes. Yeah, and then that's that's the one when the like Joe on the street says, "Oh, my kid could do that." I, this is a, this is a scam, right? <laughs> but yeah, it, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's that's also what we're talking about here is that this is stuff that skates under the radar of your audience. Um, was was every kid in the street who's reading the Simonson book going like, "Oh, I love how we defied traditional reading direction on the page." Uh, no, but they were going, man, this is exciting. And why was it exciting? Because he changed our per- our perception of the reading direction. He made us go, whoa, and look down rather than look where we expect to go, rather, you know, left to right. Yeah, very powerful so, stuff. Yeah. And achievable yeah, that's, that's with the... different kinds of elements. They don't have to be all, yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. They're... Who is this uh, new yeah. Craig Thompson, and this is using a grid, but he's using what's inside the grid mm-hmm. to guide our eye and do interesting things with the paneling. Uh, this is from his book, Goodbye Chunky Rice, which is one of his finest works, um, a, a great, great piece of comics fiction. And, you know, I'll just run through this one quickly. What, when we look at this image, um, get a different ink color so I can properly annotate this. This image is both one image one scene of two characters walking on a dock, but by, by virtue of these gutters, he's made a stop and look here first. This is panel sub one, <laughs> and this is panel sub two, right? And this is panel sub three. Now, why would we? Why do we know that? How do we know that? Well, first of all, there's by virtue of the placement, left to right, top to bottom kind of thing. But if that was the case, then we would just go like this, right? But Thompson does this lovely trick with the word balloon, Mm -hmm. snaking it cleverly through and overlapping right there to say, hey, I know you're going to look at this guy, and I know that you're going to follow what's coming out of his mouth, and so I'm going to force your eye down here first before you go over here. Look at that. And let's also talk about what he did with the overall illustration work within the panels. Let me just delete some of these lines. I'm cluttering this thing all up. Boy, oh boy, I see an awful lot of black right there that's going to catch my eye and make me want to look there, right? It's yeah, it's this uh, big weighted like, element where it just pulls your eye straight at it. Uh, once yep, you, once you get with, to that panel, it just pulls you toward it. Yep, totally. And then we've got similar elements. Look at this. Nicely opposed within the overall composition. Mm-hmm. Big puddle black here to minor puddles of black sure. there. And then we've got Working all with this odd black numbers. Right that's here. one interesting thing we didn't talk about uh, as far oh, as... Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, symmetry and asymmetry. Mm. So you could uh, choose to do one to cause... Well, so when you, when things are symmetrical, what, do, what does that inherently mean? They're sort of... I'm trying to get on camera here. Balanced. Exactly. They're balanced. Yeah. That means balanced. maybe there's force or weight, but it's not going in in one direction or another. Yeah. And now let's talk about gravity for a second. Here we got mighty Jupiter, mm-hmm. and here's Io and uh, some of the other moons. I Titan. forget all the different Jupiter, moon, Titan, and here we've got Mars and Venus. Right? Where is the weight? The weight is here. It even though we have an odd number, we also have a greater sense of weight there. That, so look at this flow. I'm going to change my ink color real quick so I can properly chart this. Look at this flow that happens where we go back up. Again, define, define traditional reading direction is not something that's inherently important to me, but I get excited when I see people trick me into going into new places on the page, right? And, and when they do it in a way that is so natural, mm-hmm. and when it's designed well, you don't question it. You just follow along and go, oh, wait, did you play a magic trick on me? Oh, I see that you did, right? So... 
Yeah, those are some of my favorite examples. Quick uh, of, observation. Uh, Do you think he's using the uh, hmm. the golden rectangle here? I mean... Oh, God, I wonder if he the, is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this paneling is sort of the first three rectangles of the golden rectangle. So. Oh, my gosh, look at that. And it follows that spiral of the golden rectangle. Yeah. I wonder if he is. I would not be surprised. So, super cool. Anyway, yeah. And then there's my silly little uh, entry into the whole thing. Um, Which that brings us full circle, else... right? I mean, yeah. The other thing I, I wanted to make sure that, that we tackled, so so we hit the elements. We hit the, the yep, that's the definitive, definitive list, folks. Oh, and just, you know, my book's coming out. You're, you're done. You graduated. Go it's, home. You got your diploma. Yeah, no more learning. Yep. Shut the brain off. Now go get a job and just, just plug in for 20 years, and then you can re retire and, you know, <laughs> go, ha go hang out in Missouri, go see Kenny Rogers sing, and kick back and relax. Uh, or you could be constantly dissatisfied <laughs> wrestling with these ideas eternally, no. like, a, like, a, a, like a fun curse to have. The fun curse. <laughs> um, because that's where we wanted to go with this is, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll end up coming back and revisiting or diving deep down into different things or whatever in, in, in design. Maybe we'll bring it back to a second part of the series or, or what have you. But what we for sure wanted to do is do the advocacy thing, uh, make sure we, we talked about the individual versus you know, d doing it for expression and service and all. I think we did a lot of what we set out to do here. We have to we have to talk about leveling up at least for a little bit, Ex though. Exactly. Ten, we promised that. Ten, ten minutes on that. Yet. So, yep. I'm ready to deliver. So, <laughs> so what would you say? Okay, we talked about a lot of different elements. We talked about all this stuff. You just recap for us. How do we, uh, what's our next step? What What are some action items people could take on today uh, in order to develop a more sophisticated sense of design, add to their toolkit and make better design projects that delight audiences Well, or themselves. Uh, exactly. So if this is resonating with you, if you're like, okay, I, you, you are excited about doing something with this because you like that, you know, I want to do magic tricks, right? I'm being, I'll put some design into my page to make it have a little more oomph and what have you. Uh, super cool. You can take this these this set of elements as like an initial grocery list or if you will and then I think what's important is trying to come up with uh, recipes you feel like making or try to trying to apply it somehow uh, that's that's my magic trick for a lot of stuff is to then just sit down and do a ton of work with <laughs> a given concept until it I have a more stronger relationship with that so for instance um, in, if you want to experiment with contrast, what would be uh, some goals that you have on your art to-do list or your comic? Like if you're if you have a, a recurring comic, that's a wonderful. In in my world, using your comic as a, as a wonderful test bed to abuse and experiment with it. it it's it's waiting for you to, to to throw these things at it. So let's say you want to deal with contrast. Maybe you want to uh, start throwing in more more spot blacks in scenes, and you want to try pu pulling people's eye in one direction or another. Or you could try to that that uh, old standby rule, like when in doubt, uh, black it out, right? Mm -hmm. And play with that, and see are you getting some kind of desired results with your contrast. And that's just one example of like pick one off the shelf and try to make something with it. And and these things can be entirely arbitrary. Whenever I'm thumbnailing a new project, um, I make very arbitrary decisions as a starting point to get me to think creatively. So, for instance, I'm thumbnailing a sequence, and I notice that three pages in a row have begun with a wide horizontal panel that spans the entire width of the page and runs about a third of the way down. And I'll say, you know what? I don't want the rhythm of this thing to be too repetitive. 
whatever happens, I'm not doing that this time. That is the one thing that is off the table on this particular page. Mm. All right, now I've created a restriction. I've created a constraint, and now I'm going to try to work around that. Is it going to be, is the panel going to run all the way down the page? Is it going to be three panels at the top? Am I going to have to take this big moment and squish it down to a smaller panel? How am I going to work with this? Uh, am, am I going to have it take half of the page vertically, but two-thirds of the page horizontally? How will I make these accommodations to fit this stuff in? And that's how I discover some of my more interesting pages, just by making very arbitrary decisions to start with. Um, so it, that comes from just looking at your work and noticing some patterns and noticing some uh, repetitiveness that you can break yourself out of by just saying, don't do that thing that I'm repeating myself on over and over again. Simple experimentation. And, and I do think if you're just beginning with a comic or if, you, if your comic is young, and, or if you if your experience uh, if you don't feel like you, if you feel like you need more experience doing this thing which you have more confidence then yeah experiment on your comic. Uh, it's funny I just posted a blog post on comicsaregreat.com. So um, the uh, the new front comic I'm doing introduces a character. This is the pe pencils from page three, everybody, which are, aren't up yet because I haven't inked them yet. Cool. But uh, in introduces a character named Dudley Courage. Who's that big shouty guy there? Mm -hmm. And who actually is a new character, but he's actually quite old. He was a character that I created back in 1991, and here's from one of those old, old... This is typing paper with pencil. From 1994, is, I think, this comic. And I didn't know what I was doing yet, you know? I was Look at that hand. That hand is awful. Awful hand. But I was playing with all that stuff, like stuff I don't do anymore, like uh, shadow placement. I don't put shadows on my work anymore. Not on the ink. I do that digitally. Uh, and playing with different line textures and things like that. Um, but this is the kind of stuff you can iterate. And eventually when you feel like you've got a handle on it, <laughs> what I just did was I just rebooted the whole thing into where it doesn't even look like that stuff anymore. Totally different now. So. Well, and so, yeah, yeah there, there's sort of the... If I... There is a bit of a puzzle of... of is something calling to you as far as to experiment with and then do you have an ongoing project that you can use to apply that and mm -hmm. if you don't yet it's that's okay to sort of mini comics <laughs> yeah. if you don't have that ongoing project just do mini comics and that's i think an even more fertile ground for doing this kind of experimentation because if you want to play with black and white all right let's go spend this weekend we're to watch nothing but noir films mm. and i'm going to try to write a noir story after that Oh, I want to play with color more, and I want to play with hypersaturated color. Oh, time to watch some, you know, Technicolor 1950s movies. And you know what? This is here's an aside, real hmm. quick. When it comes to this kind of, I really think that it's important to look at this kind of with the eye of a scientist, even though we're artists. Um, I teach a lot of teenagers, which sometimes can be like teach being in a room full of the internet where uh, if I talk about anything that is considered a little too gauche or uncool, uh, I, get, I get laughed at. You know, it's like I was, I was bringing up uh, comparisons and I mentioned uh, My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, mm. a, a cartoon series that I enjoy, although I don't identify myself as a brony. And these 17-year-old boys were visibly uncomfortable with a grown man talking about My Little Pony show, right? Uh, but to which I quickly, I quickly threw in, I was like, well, dudes, don't you, you know, watch everything? I mean, everything is worth dissecting. Everything is worth investigating and analyzing. Why does it work? Why do people like it? You know, whether it's a romantic comedy or whether it's Downton Abbey or whether it's My Little Pony or whatever, all these things are worth investigating. And so where I'm going with this is, is that, uh, you know, it's like I want to play with color. Well, let's look at some different things that use color in an interesting way. Let's look at some uh, 19... 1920s uh, silent films where they used like those gel tones to make like this scene is green, this scene is blue. That was done for a reason. When you watch the original Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and all those scenes are different colors, why did they do that? What did it achieve? Uh, and then when you watch like the like like the really hypersaturated 1950s kind of musicals, even if you don't like musicals, it's worth looking at to go what do they do and what kind of purpose does it serve. Uh, and so on, oh, right? Yeah. All this stuff, it, well, uh, you come at to, it with like the eye of a scientist. Yeah, the, not to uh, step on your point, but to extend it in yeah. in a uh, like one way to reach out to to uh, sometimes there there is a wealth of material in genres that maybe it's trapped in a genre that you don't normally visit, that kind of thing. It really does help if you have that scientific eye, where where it just sort of 
says, well, I'm going to go explore this. But then there is that chicken and egg problem of hopefully you, you are probably landing on that thing that you feel like exploring and then go ahead, exp you know, uh, rent, rent the old musicals and whatnot that maybe you wouldn't have explored before. But uh, because there's other things where you could look at how plot is arranged with both music and mm -hmm. and story and how they they interplay musicals with musicals are another. great musicals are great to watch to to really get a sense of how do they deal with exposition because that's what songs do in those movies uh, the songs really propel the plot by coming up with a simple repetitive thing a song to make you realize that to really drive the point home singing in the rain mm -hmm. when Gene Kelly's dancing around and singing in the rain. That whole scene is, my life is coming back together, and boy, oh boy, am I glad, right? And it's two and a half minutes of just that point being driven home. It's not just about snapping your fingers and tapping your feet. It's also propelling the story forward by uh, signaling to the viewer that there's been a, a, a seismic shift in this guy's life, right? So anyway, uh, I don't want to get into too much on musicals, but uh, uh, no. anyway, I just thought that that was an important one to bring up, is that some people think that... Um, you know, when I start advocating checking out all these different things, that this is me trying to push my taste on people. No, it's not, because I'll watch a scary movie, which I don't really, I'm not a huge horror fan, but, cert, you know, I'll watch certain horror films and with the analytic eye open. And it's not like I'm sitting there doing homework. It's that, it's just like, I'm curious. I want to know what, what makes this thing tick, what makes this so popular to people, what makes this compel a certain audience, right? And that is... It's basically working to expand your design vocabulary when you're doing it with that sort yeah. of approach, because perhaps you have landed on a topic where you where you realize, well, why are mysteries working? So, like, what what do people do visually in a mystery story, and how do yeah. I um, improve my paneling to match that approach? And well, then look at prior evidence and how other artists have pulled that off, and then think about. How does that how does that resonate with your voice and interests and all that? Um, yeah, it's a good approach um, because basically you have uh, finding that need and you're responding to that need. There, there you go. I, I think that's one way to oversimplify it, but it yeah. kind of is the crux of leveling up with design. It really helps to have a, a reason to to do it, and then you can really hold on to that reason and, and explore it, experiment with it in your project or a one-off project, a mini comic, one illustration even, uh, something mm -hmm. to, to now you've gained experience in immersing yourself in that design concept. And now you're going to have, well, yeah, come out of that. Yeah, you're talking about, um, Talking about basically giving yourself a course in the humanities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that in order to be a good visual storyteller, in order to, you know, be effective at this business, we have to know more than just how to draw something technically right. And when you talk about like even just doing an illustration, it's like, well, you know, there's something about Mike Mignola's work that I really enjoy. I this is I can connect with it somehow. What are you connecting with? Well, I guess you could copy his work and learn that way, and that is a way to learn. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing you could do is look at what his influences are, look up interviews with the guy, why does he draw that way, and then start investing. Go to your local library. I know I, I beat that drum a lot, folks, but I had the experience of going to my local library. This is 10 years ago. Uh, I was picking up reference material for historical data because this is for – I was drawing the flashback sequence in uh, the front. I was thumbnailing it, rather. Uh, where Rex is retelling the story of all these old ancient weapon users. And I wanted to make sure that, okay, this is approximately 600 years ago. Uh, what were people wearing back then? I didn't want to just make something up. I wanted be, it to you be able to look at the guy and go, oh, that's about 600 years ago or whatever time it was. I don't remember anymore. But So I went to the library, got some books on, on the, the um, costuming from that period, and then I also got some books of art from that period mm. just in case, just to inform my design choices and maybe I'd get some ideas for ways to express this scene visually uh, using some of uh, like tapestry art or uh, the kind of uh, art that you'd find on, I don't know, like on dishes or paintings in the background, furniture, things like mm -hmm. that. I collected all this stuff, and, I, and I, I came in to work that I was working a day job, and I came in with the stuff to like study on my lunch break, and I got the biggest razzing 
from my coworkers about using the public library. Like they're like, you might as well use mass transit. Uh, you hippie using your library. Why don't you just go to the bookstore and buy them? You know, that oh, was like okay. the, the kind of mind. This was in 2001. Yeah. It wasn't quite, bef- quite, it was just before the dot-com boom, you know, or bu- uh, bust, bust yeah. you know. So the, the economy was still doing great at the time. Um, but anyway, so I always hear that in my head when I tell people to go to the library to get research materials. But it's, it's a really great freaking resource. Um, the, the, it's definitive stuff too it's not just like a google image search where it's like some guy who posts something on his you know uh historical fiction fan site so um right. so go and give yourself an education in the humanities by saying you know what i'm going to get some books on baroque period art and just look at it and just look at it and see what it does to you see what you what kind of ideas you get oh i want to study you know uh postmodern art I want to study the Dadaists. What did they do with text? That was weird. You know, and you don't need an instructor. Although, you know, another resource would be iTunes U. You know, you go to iTunes U, and and there's a ton of free classes you can take in there. Uh, I've availed myself of that. There's an awesome course on copyright, of all things, in there, where you can get the ABCs of of how copyright works, a current copyright law. Um, I I also downloaded a series on, and this is going to show what a nerd I am. um, uh, What is it called? It's it's the theory of debate rhetoric. Oh, rhetoric, sure. Theory of rhetoric, a whole series on that, on on you know uh, making a point. <laughs> uh, I find this stuff fascinating, but you know what? You have to have a curiosity, you have to have a drive, and you have to have a willingness to expose yourself to new things. And I think just by a great thing about libraries is is that it's also a visual way. You can browse. You go into the the uh, nonfiction section. You just browse through the Dewey Decimals. Uh, you know, and just find something that's interesting. The 741s are where you're going to find the art books in that, in that neck of the woods. And, uh, you know, just discover something. Um, you also have on here in our notes uh, activity groups. Oh, sure. An art buddy. Yeah, exactly. You can, uh, uh, you can find local sketch, themed sketch events and whatnot. Um, exa- or, or, yeah, or just... Tackle this with a friend. Do you, reading groups, what have you. Reading groups. It's never been easier to find people like this online. Where and people say, "Well, how do you how do you initiate that that connection?" Um, man, I just read Ryan Estrada of RyanEstrada.com just posted an article. Uh, he didn't write it. He posted a link to it on Google Plus. It was written by Jesse Thorne of um, The Sound of Young America, right? Podcast. And he was. It's like a, it, what he called his 12-step plan of never-failing awesomeness or something, whatever kind of language that guy uses. Uh, and he highlights all these different successful people in the new media. And one of the things he talks about in there is uh, Merlin Mann's You Look Nice Today podcast and how that came to be. And it turned out that Merlin Mann and the other two co-hosts um, were just all guys on Twitter. They didn't know each other. And they just tweeted different things. They liked each other's tweets. But that turned into them talking to each other on Twitter, which turned into emailing, which turned into them doing a show mm-hmm. now, and now they're all friends, right? And it's a very popular show. Um, I've said in many other places that my, my what I consider my graduate school was uh, not only working with Tom Root on the comics I did when, in my time at Ar- Antarctic Press, but it was also, uh, I have a, a really good friend who's not a cartoonist. He's like my one friend who doesn't, participate in the creative arts i talk to him every wednesday every wednesday without fail for the past going on 20 years we talk on the phone for about an hour and just catch up with each other and just you know just talk and the majority of that 20 years was us talking about transformers and really just dissecting the living hell out of that series and debating things like uh, topic of the day, was Starscream the greatest traitor that ever lived, or was he the greatest Decepticon loyalist? And we debated this thing like a couple of big nerds. Now, that's just nerd fun talk. That's just me just talking about Transformers because I like them. But in dissecting this, we cracked the code of what made those stories so good to us. We really spent a lot of time digging at it to where now I can say, oh, a Sunbow show has these essential qualities, and these qualities are things that I can apply in my own work. So just having an art buddy and meeting them naturally and, and how do you meet somebody naturally by being yourself and being honest and being genuine and, you know, post some things online and, and try to strike up conversations with people who you, you think you'd get along with. Um, 
you can get a lot of work done that way just by being social. Absolutely. Well, that reminds me of how valuable you, you made a whole bunch of interesting points in there. One thing I was curious about, like, right. so did you study, uh, are you studying rhetoric to now like to level up in your analysis of, because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it, exactly that it. Yeah. It's... Uh, what's fun. It's ironic. Like just, uh, uh, what, two weeks ago I, I bought, um, what, uh, rhetoric, poetics and logic from audible and uh, by Aristotle. <laughs> so and it's read by a man awesome. with an amazing accent. Oh my God. <laughs> he experiencing his voice reading that material is worth the, the price uh, of, of entry. And it's, it is very interesting. It, well, anyway, aspects of it are very interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of court proceeding -y kind of stuff, but it's about how, how can you frame up something in a logical argument and the motivations you'd have and all that kind of stuff. But it, it's, communication trying to understand communication well and, and actually stepping back to some really classic ancient examples that can be very helpful whether um be, let's see i i um i'm still on a quest to really figure out uh my right my voice and writing and, and whatnot and i intend to uh, uh like i was trying to get through gilgamesh and mm. um oof but uh but i uh Oh gosh, I have had uh, you know some luck getting through other classics, and I would have never just jumped into that in in a normal day to day experience. What do I want to put into my information stream for entertainment or news or yeah. something? It would have. I'm gonna read this thing that was written in an ancient language, which was translated, and and this was before the novel structure was invented, long before. Mm -hmm. Dude, I tried to finish *Le Mort de Arthur* mm -hmm. by Thomas Mallory. The original Arthur legend uh, from the 1100 or so, oh. uh, 1800 pages. I think I got 1100 pages in before I was like, Bleh, I don't even know who I'm reading about anymore. <laughs> so many nights, so many nights were waxing wroth, and uh, and and you know, uh, all the oh, I forget the names of all the different beasts that they chase in the forest, adventurous and all. Things, right. But, Boy, oh boy, you know, yeah, that, sometimes that stuff can be very tough reading. Well, and in some uh, ways, that, that's like going camping and appreciating that it's nice to have running water and whatnot, yeah. where, hey, people have yeah. worked on these things, and we've collectively learned from one, one another. And and, uh, yeah. and anyway, finding different ways to dive into it to form your own vocabulary of it. And, uh, and you, the other thing about your point is, too, you could pick one thing and dive deep into it. And... Yep. N and never look for another thing because you could find an infinite set of possibilities there, well, especially in a series where there's there's many hours of of art produced by many people. Yeah. So yeah, you can learn a lot that way. What I like about what we're talking about here, what I think is especially awesome, is I, I'm anticipating somebody listening or watching and saying, "Just get to the book recommendation. Tell me what book I need to read." Uh uh, no, you yeah, don't get off nothing, that easy. Nothing up my sleeve. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's no quick answer here. I, I think, no, there's no quick answer. And what's even more interesting to me is we're really advocating that people wander, wander, discover, and play. And that's, that's one of the best ways to really kind of trip upon something awesome is don't just go read X book because I read it and enjoyed it because you may get something completely different out of that. What I am saying is the, the theory of what we're talking about is way more interesting, and that is have a sense of curiosity, develop a sense of curiosity, and you can develop it. This isn't this is a learned skill. This isn't something that you're either born with or you're not. You go and you discover one new thing and then you say interesting. You write down the interesting parts. Move on to the next thing. See where it leads you. Um, I you know, I, I get asked all the time, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do what you do? And the the answer I come up and I'm not trying to be all Taoist about this, but it really does boil down to all I do is watch for when something makes me go, uh, or uh, or ho. Oh. And then the next question is why? And if I don't have an answer, time to do some ser uh, searching and studying on that subject and crunch on it for a while. Um, and with any luck, the, the whys will never stop coming. But uh, it really does boil down to just that one thing, just being being observant and being curious. That's how you do it. That's how you get better. That's how you level up, and that's how you invent. D did I say anything that that? Did I just come up with like the back of a Tony Robbins book with that? <laughs> I feel like I did. I 
you would have to have a smile way bigger. Um, you would need to flex a muscle now and then, and oh, you yeah. know, perhaps uh, at least at least two to three bikini women would have to be <laughs> flanking you. He did do a TED talk, so there's his le- legitimacy right there. No, and uh, um, you know what? I back in the day, I listened to his stuff. Whatever. So. There's nothing wrong with yeah. with his stuff. You know, no, you know, I, I I bash on motivational speaking sometimes, and I think I need to lay off because I do think it has its purpose. It it serves a function. Um, it's just it's not it's not it, that's not the uh, currency I like to deal in is all. And that, but that doesn't mean that I should be taking a a big, big steaming load on somebody else for. Doing <laughs> I would it. like to draw another point to that topic in a couple <laughs> different ways, not related to your <laughs> metaphor, but. Um... <laughs> Sorry. So, so, okay. Um, I can understand having a frustration or, or, or sort of a, a, a difficulty with, with uh, some of the techniques that, that some communicators choose to use. Because some of them, yeah. well, one of the reasons why you, you, you read and study the framing of ideas and presenting of them is to, there's diff- you can learn how to, well, be convincing and... Mm-hmm. How do you well storytelling? You're 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 controlling reality when you tell someone a story. You get to present causality, like this cause this cause that, and have ambiguity where you feel like it. Have it all be cut and dried mm-hmm. where you feel like it. And you're the storyteller. It's your world. You have control of that. Yeah. Um, for the most part, because of course your audience can imagine things beyond that. But within there i mean so you can use these things to different ends and sometimes like like i i find certain kinds of marketing frustrating or whatever like i i would have a hard i have a hard time watching commercial television and that kind of stuff um and they're mm-hmm. just using same kinds of things that that we'd be using in uh in to some extent design elements design principles fashion heuristics and they're looking at one other thing that i wanted to bring up regarding leveling up which is how do things affect people and studying people and how do we get meaning from things? How do we get emotional reaction to things and whatnot? And one way I look at it is, uh, is it's it's informed by the book we've mentioned uh, a a few times. That is like my recent, really my, my recent favorite example of that, which is the hundred things every designer must know by Susan Weinschenk. She's actually a neuroscientist and she's a user interface designer and so she's looking at, well, how the brain works, how do people perceive things, how do we learn, how do we communicate in ways that li- align well with how people function, both uh, uh, emotionally, intellectually, and sort of primally. And so that's mm-hmm. another area to, to, to sort of, um, you know, do some, do some uh, sifting for gold. If, if you're just wondering, how did this thing Absolutely. affect me? How could I cause that effect? Yeah, just doing some studying on uh, studying up on psychology and sociology and the social sciences in general yeah. um, would be good a good place to start wandering to get some ideas on how to, how to, how to how, what is the effect I want to have on people and how do how do people become affected by things that that is a great place to go. Um, we should wrap up soon because I know Adobe Connect gets uh, really upset if we go over an hour and a half. Yep. Um, so, uh, and then also, you know, all the stuff about library talking, it goes for iTunes. Go in and do a search for podcasts on all these different subjects, and I do this all, all the time. Uh, <laughs> I just subscribed to a competitive eating podcast because I recently discovered uh, c- that competitive eating is very, very compelling to me for some reason. It just, it, it I'm enraptured by it, and I only recently discovered it. <laughs> and then the next question I ask is, why? Mm. Why am I crippled with laughter when I watch somebody trying to eat more food than another guy in, you know, in less time? And, you know, after crunching on it for a couple of weeks, I came to the conclusion that no other animal on Earth shows its superiority by eating more food than another animal in a faster amount of time. Like, you'll have the cat do the thing where you can't have my food until I'm done. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. But that's a threat of force, right? That's like, I'm going to kick your butt if you try to eat my food. But no animal's like, I'll show you. I'm going to eat three elephants, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then all the lady animals are like, whoa, look at him. He ate three elephants. I want to mate with that. So... <laughs> 
upon thinking about it, I realized that this is a purely human thing. Mm. And that's got me thinking more. I want to investigate this thing further. I want to follow up on this. So, you know, it's like there's there's a podcast about everything. And, oh, another one I just subscribed to, uh, the Mental Mental Illness Happy Hour, which is a show by a stand-up comedian who um, interviews other stand-up comedians about their therapy. They talk openly about the therapy they've undergone and what they learned from Interesting. it. Interesting. Psychology. And I'm learning about, you know, I'm getting to hear these open and frank discussions, sometimes uncomfortable, uh, but learning a lot about people, right? So doesn't that just have to be something weird and silly like competitive eating? Uh, so, yeah, that was in our notes, too, for, well, your notes, uh, you know. Books, podcasts, oh, go to your library. There's so much. Uh, yeah. And I, in all all sorts of different uh, disciplines, it's worth looking into. Um, one more I worth mentioning is, let's say you wanted to practice uh, the impact of your words. You could do some tweeting and you could read. And actually, I do recommend the audiobook version of uh, Strunk and White's Elements of Style. Uh, it's read by a gentleman who has a wonderful Scottish accent. And he's passionate about the topic, yeah, or at least it really comes across in how he reads. So, and and I find a lot of humor when someone speaks passionately in a Scottish accent about sentence structure and grammar. So, <laughs> you uh, you still haven't read Thomas Carlyle's work yet, have mm -hmm. you? No, I haven't. Uh, big uh, Scottish guy from like 1890 who did a lot of orating on um, heroes in mythology. Mm. Seriously. I, torqued off Scottish guy. Now, I don't, there's no audiobook that I know of of his stuff, but his stuff is public domain, so it's easy enough to get through, like, Google Books. I happen to have, like, an 1899 copy of of some of his essays on heroes, hero worship, and the heroic in history. Mm. Man, oh, man, he's so mad, but he's so persuasive that it's just like he makes you want to go out and punch dinosaurs in the face. He gets you so riled up about how awesome humans are. Uh, but it's written in the style of... You know, 19th century Europe, so it's very sometimes dense reading. It's very difficult to parse through sometimes, but anyway. Very true. There's another one. Um, so. so much. All right, and, and I, I think we could go on and on as far as resources. And, and uh, Yeah, we could. It's uh, Well, yeah. you, know, you know what people could do for resources, for more resources and more access to us? Um, they could go to leanintoart.com slash workshops mm -hmm. and... Uh, you could support us by if you if you thought this stuff was good and you thought this was compelling and I gosh I wish I had more man there's forty hours more of material at leanintoart.com slash workshop where you can purchase a workshop today for as little as twenty five bucks that helps support us and helps us uh, fund the resources that we use to make these shows, mm -hmm. um, but then it also grants you access to the Lean Into Art forums where you can get um, you know the extra the what what are they called the after dark casts yeah um, and you can have a direct channel to us in there where we can talk more about different resources. You can ask, hey, Rob, what are, what are six more resources I need to have today? And Rob can oblige. So lean into art.com slash workshops. Very good. So, so concludes this question mark. Third of, of uh, our three initial attempts at uh, really kicking around the ball of design. Yep. We passed it across the court a couple times. We did. We played half court style. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll come back to this. We'll come back to this, I'm sure, because I'm sure our thoughts are going to change on this. This is not a definitive thing. We never meant it to be a definitive thing. This was a preliminary stab at it that we can build upon with further iterations of the series. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So, okay. Well, um, are we just going to get out of here then? Is I think it? we're closing it up, man. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks, Rob. Thanks for instigating this one. This was an, uh, an unexpectedly uh, fun and exhilarating exploration. I did not think I had this much to say about design. I really didn't. Oh, and you have way more to say about it, but uh, that's all right. We can, we're, we'll, we'll channel it in other topics and, and uh, keep this going and, and, and as the, because it's not the end of the series of podcasts and what this was also is a way of us iterating at doing miniseries, which is why I was yep. really excited to do one because we have yep. some more planned. Yep. And now I think we're in better, better concert pitch to do such a thing. Yeah. So 
So, okay. Well, thanks everybody for downloading and listening. Tell your friends about leanintoart.com slash workshops. That would be a really nice thing to do for us today. And it's, it'd be free for you to tell them about it. Uh, and uh, until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I have been Rob Stenzinger of Interactive-Storyteller.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye.